Hello, you're listening to an interview with Josh Mercer from episode 23 of the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. Like and subscribe to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play, and follow us at Catholic Vote on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. And now the time has come for our weekly political discussion with Catholic Vote Political Director Josh Mercer. How are you doing, Josh? Good to be with you. Well, the big thing on everyone's mind is the Second Amendment and the debates surrounding it. I was just talking with Amber Athey about it. And culturally, there's a lot of tension, a lot of really hatred being stirred up here. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I just think that you see a big gulf in opinion between people who live in big cities like Chicago or New York, and they just can't imagine why anyone would want a gun. And then you have a people who live in the heartland, they live in rural areas and they're used to guns. And the idea that some wacko goes and slaughters 20 people, that's horrible. But to them, the question isn't necessarily the gun, it's the person that's behind it. Because of course, if all the kids are lined up for school, ready for their moms or dads to pick them up from school, you could just as easily take a car and run over a 30 people or whatever and kill people. I mean, that's another device that you could use to kill people. Uh, The question is, Why on God's green earth would you want to kill so many people? What is driving people? The whole point of this is uh, self-defense. Well, I mean, self-defense on a large scale, if you back up a ways, what's going on with the purpose of the Second Amendment is sure self-defense, but in my opinion, also resisting massive human rights violations. That's the real purpose of it. The biggest human rights violations of the past century were by government, right? They were by people who took control of governments democratically and then became despots or tyrants. And this is where mass graves come from and gulags and concentration camps. Those things had to be preceded by a cultural shift by which people became willing to hand over their guns to that government that eventually committed the mass atrocities. So, I mean, that's, in my opinion, that's fundamentally the purpose of the Second Amendment. But that's kind of a tangent. Which, you know, the left wants to get rid of. And the thing is, it's funny, liberals almost always want to know what the root causes of something are. You know, if conservatives are saying we need to crack down a crime, the liberals are like, well, wait, what is the root cause of crime? Why is this person committing this crime? So the, le- the left always wants to look at the root causes of crime or the root causes of hunger or poverty or whatever, but they never want to discuss the root causes of these school shootings. Why is it that this person decided to go into Florida and kill 17 people at a school? Because when I grew up, the idea that somebody would want to go mass murder so many people, well, I think we have to start asking ourselves, what happens when we have a school shooting? If we provide wall-to-wall coverage every time there's a school shooting, then someone who's a deadbeat loner, you know, crazy guy or whatever is like, well, I know what I can do. I can go out in a blaze of glory. It reminds me of in the early 1980s, there were these people that would run onto the baseball and football fields and right. they, they were naked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Streakers. And what happened for a while is the TV stations would giggle about it and they'd love it and they'd pan in on it. And, you know, they wouldn't show the nudity necessarily, but they'd get a big kick out of it. Or someone would run on the field with a beach ball or something like that. Well, what happened? Major League Baseball and the National Football League went to the networks and said, hey, listen, you can't do this anymore or we're not going to re-sign our contract with you. You're not going to have the TV rights. We'll go to another TV network that will be on the same page as us. Yeah. Because if you do that, we're just going to get more and more copycats. People are like, oh, great. I'll get on TV. I'll do this. And so the network said, okay, okay, I gotcha. We will never show anyone streaking or any fans jump out on the field or whatever the case may be. We're not going to show it on the air. We'll just kind of say, oh, someone's done something dumb. We're not going to show it because we don't do that. Right. You need to do that same sort of thing with people who do mass killings. Yeah. Don't give them the attention. Yeah. Starve them of oxygen. Yeah. Like you had mentioned earlier, like what is in between these guys' ears? What is wrong with our culture that we would produce young people that have this insane bloodlust? Right. I mean, the point I keep trying to tell people is that in the 1970s and the 1980s, we actually had just as many guns then as we do now. What? Why is it that we're having school shootings all the time now where we didn't 30, 40 years ago. And I think the part of the reason is if you start connecting the dots, yes, there's the media saturation of the cable news that we didn't have. Yes, I think there is the element of they can get their name out there. Um, I also think video games uh, try to draw out some of this bloodlust. And But the biggest thing, the biggest cultural shift, what have we seen more than anything else, is the breakdown of the family. Well... You know, you know, it's the interesting thing, Stephen, is that we've actually seen a decrease in the divorce rate 
But what's happened is just fewer and fewer people are deciding to get married. So whereas 30 or 40 years ago, they would have married and at least tried it out for a little bit and, and try to stick it out, see if it could last. Now they're not even doing it. You know, they have children together, but they decide not to get married and it doesn't necessarily last. There's a lot of problems that are hitting white working class people and also black working class people where these marriage rates are very, very, very low and it needs to be increased for all of them. If we're going to create new human life, we want to make sure that that daughter or son especially has the role of a father to help them along in life. And girls, if they don't have a father, have their problems to be sure. But boys that don't have a father figure in their life can get to be really unruly and they don't know how to handle their passions and their and their anger and their wrath. And so I think we're starting to see some of that. If you look at the connections between some of these uh, mass murderers, a lot of them don't have a strong father figure in their life. Yeah, well, I mean, this is generally the case because of the just physical and, and biological differences between males and females. When men don't have father figures and they have horrible upbringings, they hurt people. When women have the same problem in their upbringing, they get hurt. Uh, and that, that, right, tends, that tends to be the case just because men are much more outward yes. facing and much more uh, the way they act out is much more aggressive. Uh, whereas with women, they right. tend to seek acceptance and belonging more than men. And so they end up being on the much more on the losing end of this kind of cultural decay. Right, right. They get into abusive relationships or where people take advantage of them. Yeah, no, that's certainly the case. I mean, I think that we could have this discussion about whether or not to ban bump stocks. We can talk about whether or not we should raise the age on guns from 18 to 21. Some of these things might help. I think if we warm ourselves into a complacency, thinking that all we'll have to do is regulate some guns a little bit more here and there, and then we're going to solve this problem, we're forgetting the larger cultural rot. Right. And I think I think we'll be lulled into a sense of, oh, well, we, we, we've done something. And that's the, one of the biggest problems with American life is that this the strong desire to do something. Well, obviously, when there's a tragedy and all these problems are happening, we have a revulsion to inactivity. I appreciate that. We also don't want it just to be like, well, we have to do something for the sake of something. Whether or not it actually helps seems to not really concern us. Yeah. So the question I was going to open this with is, is Trump going soft on gun control and giving too much ground to the left? I don't think he really is. There aren't any fundamental threats to the Second Amendment going on here with bump stocks and raising the age. Most you're going to get out of this is something that's just annoying to people who are not accustomed to the age limit. Um, but if we really want Trump to solve the problem, to quote unquote, do something, well, it's going to be a long slog. But the biggest things he could do would be to bolster our culture, which is very much in line, actually, with his platform. He's not a very good representative of healing the culture because he has been well, very much immersed in that culture and doesn't have a past that exactly exemplifies masculine virtue or family values. Well, but okay. he should bolster you know, he's those been things. Very, he's been very crass, yeah. and he's the furthest thing from upstanding Christian sexual morality. There's no doubt there. So I don't disagree with that assessment. But- one thing he does have in common with Barack Obama, who I also do not, I mean, I do not care for Barack Obama, obviously, but Barack Obama and actually Donald Trump, I believe, have been good fathers to their children. I think Donald's been good for Donnie Jr. and Eric and Barron and stuff like that. I mean, I think, you know, he's been there for him. He's warned his kids to stay away from drugs. He, I mean, Donald Trump doesn't even drink alcohol because his brother died. Of addiction. Yeah, that's one uh, one that's one aspect of Trump that where where I can say he's better than me. He doesn't. He's a total tea, He's a teetotaler and doesn't smoke, which is something. You know, well, I struggle I mean, with both. he knows his <laughs> he knows his limits on it, so therefore he doesn't touch it. But with regards to that, like the importance of having a father around, I think he could speak to that. No doubt. That's about That's right. It. Well, and as a one last little sign off note, also we need to be praying. One prayer chain that I can recommend happens to be uh, for my parish priest, Father Richard Heilman. Uh, he does 54-day novenas and has tens of thousands of followers who pray these novenas. They're a daily rosary and reflections. So if anyone's interested in that, that is actually worth looking up as well. It's called Novena for Our Nation. They touch on topics like this as well. So let's do that, not put all of our eggs in the basket of policy or immediacy, and just hope for the best and pray for the best. So. Thank you very much, Josh, for this semi-political, more cultural commentary this week. And I look forward to talking again next week about hopefully a more happy subject. All right. Well, thanks again, Stephen. 
Well, thanks for listening to this interview from episode 23 of the Catholic Boat Radio Hour. Again, you can like and subscribe to the Catholic Boat Radio Hour on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play. And don't miss the rest of this episode coming Friday. I'm your host, Stephen Harry. On your-